Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the opening keynote by CEO WPP, Sir Martin Sorrell. But first, please welcome NAPI President and CEO, Rick Feldman. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 48th edition of the NAPB Market and Conference, this year in glorious Miami Beach. Last year, we adopted the moniker Content First as a branding theme to distinguish our organization from all the others. For these three days, our intent is to furnish an exceptional environment for a robust transactional business and to seriously discuss the conceptual and practical challenges and opportunities that you all deal with daily. NatB is a global marketplace. A full one-third of our attendees come from 67 countries other than the United States. Boundaries of space and time and geography are being redrawn by technology every day, but the human need to negotiate across the desk or around the pool does not go away. In the U.S., one thing is for sure. Americans watched more television than ever in 2010, an average of 34 hours per person per week. That viewership translated to over $60 billion in ad spend. Much of what is seen here will either travel to distant points or came here from being born elsewhere. Here at NatB, we celebrate this content and focus on its creation, funding, and distribution across all platforms. I hope you find your time here this week to be enjoyable as well as productive. We dialed up the social networking this year, beginning last night at the Eden Rock and tonight around the pool, thanks to our lead sponsor, TV Globo Brazil. Also, tickets for tomorrow's Tartikoff Awards are available all day tomorrow for $125, and I'll remind you the proceeds go directly to our educational foundation. And we have a closing party on Wednesday night as well at the Eden Rock. So please check out the other events and also note the brand Innovation Day scheduled for all day Wednesday. I'd like to thank our sponsors, without whom all of this wouldn't be possible. Also, our wonderful board and staff for their contributions and their hard work. Our hardest worker and retiring board chair has been tireless in his support. And, I thank, and as I thank him, please welcome Mr. Kevin Beggs. Thank you, Rick. And welcome all of you to NAPD 2011. We are back and in Miami. The heat you feel is not only from its tropical climate and sometimes unstoppable basketball team, it's the heat of content turning into dollars in the suites, conference rooms, cabanas, restaurants, and bars of the beautiful Fountain Blue Hotel. How about a round of applause for this place? After many years of schlepping between the NAPTI floor and the suites of the hotel, fending off snowboard enthusiasts, the occasional adult film star, NAPTI has a home of its own, and the response has been tremendous. Thousands of you are here representing media in over 60 countries. Thank you for being here. Rick touched on the technological changes affecting us all. The biggest breakthrough in technology, aside from Facebook and Netflix this year that's taken place at NAPTI, is that Rick purchased a BlackBerry. Uh, it, it, it was a painful decision after five years of lobbying, and I told them that if he did finally purchase the BlackBerry, I would step down as chairman. Uh, and, he, and he's done it. So we're, we're all excited about that. And there's a side benefit. He talks a little less, texts a little more. But uh, we're, having a, we're having a good time with it. We have a tremendous marketing conference in store for you this week. And to kick it off, we have an extraordinary keynote speaker with us to introduce him is MediaLink CEO and industry powerhouse, Mr. Michael Kasson. In its recent Influencers edition, AdAge describes Mr. Kasson as follows. Silicon Valley and Madison Avenue have a lot dividing them, but at least one thing in common, MediaLink CEO Michael Kasson. The former Initiative Media Worldwide President is a matchmaker, a marketing and entertainment guru, and a consigliere to top brands. The CMO of Coca-Cola recently remarked, that if WPP and McKinsey were to procreate, MediaLink would be the child. It is my true pleasure to introduce 25-year NAPD veteran and personal friend, Mr. Michael Kasson.
Thank you, Kevin, and thank you, Rick, and good evening. And welcome to Kiss and Punch, which is not the title of Sarah Palin's next reality show, but rather the headline around tonight's talk. We are assembled to learn how collaboration and competition can coexist for the benefit of all. Actually, we're here to listen to the man who, if he didn't actually coin the by now, by now iconic buzzword frenemies, certainly was the one to first use it. So he ought to know. We're here to learn about how brands and content can work together for the benefit of both. We're here to discover how all of this plays out, not just on Madison and Vine, or on Manhattan Island, or in Silicon Valley, or even in South Beach, but around the world. Does our speaker tonight know about that? Does he ever? As Mae West once famously admitted, I've been things and seen places. Sir Martin Sorrell gets smacked around a whole lot more than he gets smooched by the media, but then again, the media never could identify a point it couldn't miss. Truth is, even though I have been blessed with the opportunity to hang around with some smart and successful people in my career, I don't know anyone that is as impressive as the founder and CEO of WPP, Sir Martin Sorrell. Not because Martin owns a global business and runs a global business that currently claims somewhere in the range of $15 billion or so in revenues, although I find that interesting. Not because one out of every four spots aired on this planet are bought by one of the companies within WPP, although I find that alluring. Not even because his enterprise is the largest holding company, or as he calls it, parent company in the world. That I find irresistible. Being number one, by the way, is a designation that WPP has won, lost, and regained three separate times in its relatively brief lifetime, which tells you all you need to know about Martin Sorrell's competitiveness. But none of that is why Sir Martin impresses me. He impresses me because he's one of the most prescient business, has one of the most prescient business minds I've ever seen. This man predicted unbundling more than a decade before it happened. He saw the potential of emerging markets way before any of his peers were making speeches about them. He foresaw the digital revolution, fragmentation, integrated marketing, the smartphone's potential, and a host of other epic transformations in media, marketing, and entertainment. Martin knows that it's not just the size of your business that matters, it's the creativity with which you do your business. He also famously said, people who fail, fail because they're not involved enough. Those of you who know, who, who know Martin know that that does not apply. Small wonder then that WPP, the companies within WPP would be clearly the leaders and pioneered modern branded entertainment. They were first or among the first to add a production company to their portfolio and entertainment executives like Peter Tortorisi to their top management. Easy to understand why the WPP Media Services umbrella, Group M, constantly pushes the envelope in partnerships with content creators, creating new and inventive ways to maximize product integrations and brand content team-ups across all platforms in every discipline. Maybe you're more of a kisser, maybe you're more comfortable swinging away, but it doesn't matter. You're gonna learn something extraordinary this evening, and you're gonna learn that for, from Sir Martin Sorrell. Martin. Thank, thank you, Michael. It, it, it probably the, the preamble uh, is, is greater than what you're going to uh, hear after the preamble. It was rather like a bar mitzvah, actually, a sort of procession of people um, demanding time in front. But um, Kiss and Punch, I guess, is the, the title. I should say, firstly, to Rick and to Michael and uh, everybody else that I'm delighted to be here. and. Uh, uh, honored, I guess, is the, uh, the time-worn phrase to be, uh, to be asked to speak to you about Kiss and Punch uh, competing and cooperating in our industry. And um, I, 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 I wondered, I, I don't have a set speech, and I was sort of thinking about, you know, what, what would be of greatest interest to this audience. And I, I thought the, the best thing for me to do would be a couple of things. I, if I, and we've talked, the... Um, the talk-to-do ratio in the area that uh, I've been asked to talk about uh, is, is very high. There's be, always been a lot of talk in our industry 
amongst media owners uh, and uh, indeed amongst clients about content creation. There's been a lot of talking and very little doing. It's, it's similar in, in, in my view to what we see in the sports industry, in the entertainment industry. In fact, it was Beyonce's manager that alerted me a few years ago to the talk to do ratio. And uh, I remember that conversation about two or three years ago and I said, well, we've got to get it down. Uh, and I have to say two or three years on, we haven't managed to get it down. So my, my basic plea or my basic premise would be, uh, or basic hypothesis would be, that what we have to try and do is work the triumvirate. And that triumvirate is our clients, which are the, in my view, the most important group that we have to work with, to get the media owners, who I regard increasingly as being quasi-clients or half-clients, and last but not least, the agencies, which uh, WPP and others, uh, uh, Erwin Gottlieb, who runs Group M, I'll come on to that in a minute, uh, is here with us, and Michael has mentioned Peter Tortorichu, who looks after Group M Entertainment, that that triumvirate, that sort of alliance, uh, has to work much more closely together. In fact, we as agencies have to treat media owners almost in exactly the same way as we treat our clients. We have to walk together with them much more closely. Now, Michael touched on WPP. We, we started WPP 25 years ago. Um, we started actually WPP, to, to mystify you completely, stands for Wire and Plastic Products. It was a, a small engineering company. Actually, we made uh, wire baskets for supermarkets. And I'll come back to supermarkets because they are important in some way in the context of what retail and the power of retail is important in the context of what I'm going to talk about in part. Um, we had a market capitalization of a million pounds. And today, 25 years on, uh, we have 140,000 people uh, in 107 countries. And that's important because uh, it was mentioned previously that NAPI by Rick, that NAPI is, uh, works in a number of countries. The sponsor of this session is TV Globo. Uh, who I have a remarkable affection for. I go to Brazil quite, quite uh, often, and TV Globo, as you know, dominates the Brazilian television industry. There's, there's one other uh, record, I think it's called, which is, uh, which is the second channel there, but Globo has about, what, 60, 70%. It's rather like Azteca uh, and Televisa, or the other way around, Televisa and Azteca in, in Mexico. Um, but uh, we now have, we're in 107 countries, so the international dimension is critically important. Uh, our largest client, I should mention this, is Ford Motor Company. Our second largest is Procter & Gamble. Our third largest is Unilever. Our fourth is J&J. Uh, sorry, our fourth is Microsoft, and our fifth is J&J, to give you a flavor of it. But we work not just with the big multinational companies, but the smaller local companies, the multinationals of the future, uh, and indeed uh, the regional companies, which also will become the multinationals of the, of the future. Um, as Michael said, we have 15 billion, or the year that's just closed, I'm making you insiders now, I guess, to some extent. Analysts predict that we had 15 billion, to put it in uh, more politically correct terms, $15 billion of revenue last year. Analysts are predicting we will have 16 billion this year. But much the more important figure is the media portfolio that Irwin and his colleagues run through Mindshare, through MEC, through Mediacom, and through Maxis. And that, according to RECMA, and in fact, it's an audited figure because we actually do, do, do provide in our accounts each year, unlike any of our competitors, what our volume is, what our billings and turnover is. And according to RECMA, it's about $70 billion. And as Michael said correctly, about one in three or one in four ads that you will see, whether they be online or offline, new media or old media, are placed uh, by Group M and its constituent agencies in Brazil, actually, by, because media buying agencies aren't permitted, uh, in Brazil by our advertising agencies such as uh, JWT and Ogilvy and YNR and Gray uh, are placed by, by our organization. We're very proud of that. But I th the point I want to make, and it's central to what I'm talking about this evening, is that that media portfolio, Irwin calls it media investment management. And we, we call that section of our business not media planning and buying but media investment management. That's actually a very wise phrase because we are actually in the 
in the business or have the role of being a, quote, independent, unquote, advisor to our clients. It's a responsibility, and I'll maybe somewhat controversially, but I'll, I'll try and be a bit controversial. We, you know, that's an independent position. It's not a position that should or could be, in my view, biased, although there are some things going on in the industry where that position, I think, is threatened, that position of independence, but it's incredibly important that we manage that portfolio because we have to manage whether that 70 billion is the right figure. We have to decide with our clients whether it should be greater or whether it should be less. And particularly with the greater fragmentation that's taking place in both new media and old media, de decide where that money should go. Now, the, the real power, in my view, of WPP is the fact that over the last, really it's over the last 10 years, we've consolidated our buying points. So, for example, in the UK, we used to have four media buying points. Well, we didn't even have four because we created Mindshare. Uh, Michael made mention of this about the, the unbundling of media. We, we created Mindshare out of the old media departments of Ogilvy and JWT. In fact, I would argue that the media planning and buying parts of that, those operations were not going anywhere, and specialization was needed. So around the mid-80s, late-80s, early-90s of the last millennium, we decided to, to unbundle our media planning and buying operation into a true media investment management operation. Media was rather unloved uh, amongst the creative agencies. Uh, they were the sort of dispossessed or the disadvantaged. You know, at, at presentations, you would go in and make a presentation, and the creative part of the presentation would lead or with, the, with the planning part, and often the media part fell off the back of the presentation truck. And, and, and media people were not well remunerated. They weren't highly respected. They were, didn't have the best cars. They didn't have the bed off, best offices. And people like uh, Dennis Holt and Chris Ingram and the Rodez family started, uh, MPG, started independent media operations. And of course, as usual, the big agencies, creative, so-called creative-led agencies, were slow to respond, but eventually did respond. In fact, they've, they've reabsorbed most of the media independence with one or two uh, exceptions. But if you look at our operation, I think the real opportunity is in the media investment management part of our business because of the size, the complexity, the scope and scale of that portfolio. So as I talk this evening, just think about that 70 billion. Think about the responsibility we have of working with our clients with that, with that concentration, which we now put into one buying point in the UK. Uh, we re are responsible for about a quarter of all TV, about a third of print, probably a little bit bigger now since even though the government has reduced spending at the COI, which is the government's ad agency because of spending cuts, uh, we're probably a little bit higher than that, probably in total around 33, 34, 35% of the market. In other markets like India, we're 50% of the market. Brazil, probably about 25. Russia, about 25. China, about 15, but with a market leading position. Now, the reason I go through that is these are not I'm not, I, I am boastful about it. I would admit I am proud of it, and I think we should be proud of it, WPP. But there's, there's serious points here. And I, I just want to dwell a second on our strategy, because it's terribly important, I think, for the media owners, both legacy traditional media owners and new media owners, to understand where we're coming from. Because a central point, one of the, the central points that, that I want us to sort of emphasize this afternoon or this evening is that traditionally what, what, what we've done, or what media owners, I think, have done with our clients, is try to sell pre-packaged ideas or pre-ordained ideas to our clients. I mean, I, 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 before I, I started WPP, and in fact, before that, when I was CFO of Saatchi's for nine years, before that, I worked for Mark McCormack at IMG, uh, which Teddy Forsman now owns. And I always remember that, that Mark uh, and, and I used to talk about both before when I was working for him and when I started, uh, when I was at Saatchi's then at WPP, how we could bring uh, IMI, IMG, uh, International Merchandising Group, the, the group that represented in the very old days 
Arnold Palmer, and Gary Player, and Jack Nicholas in, in New Day's clients such as Tiger Woods, etc. How Roger Federer? How could we work more closely with clients uh, such as uh, a Ford or a Unilever or a P&G? How could we work much more closely with them? And the problem was that Mark, when he was alive, and he sadly died a few years ago, when he was alive, they had prepackaged product. They had prepackaged ideas. They had preordained ideas that they then sought to try and sell to clients. So you had a match play championship in the UK. You sold it to a tobacco company. They had restrictions. It was then sold to uh, a car company, Toyota, then on to HSBC. And often the decision depended upon the likes or dislikes of the management of the company rather than in the strategic relevance of the package or idea to the company. And I think it's critically important that media owners and that we as agencies make media owners understand what it is clients want, what they're trying to do, and how they're going about it. And there have been some changes taking place, which I think it's worth spending a few minutes just dwelling on, on what's happened. Well, the, uh, there, are, there are about eight or nine things that we see going on, some of which are highly relevant to what, media, to what media owners might think about, and some of which are less so. But just very quickly, the first is the obvious one, which I've touched on, the, the global shifts that are taking place. Massive shifts in political, economic, social, industrial power. People talk about the East. Michael referenced, you know, we started writing about this in 1994 in our annual report. But it's not just that. It's the, the shift to the South, to countries such as Brazil. Brazil, in our view, this will be the decade of Latin America. Brazil will host a World Cup in 2014 and Olympic Games in 2016. We will have a World Cup in Russia in 2018 in Qatar in 2022. Set, Set Blatter talks about FIFA going to new lands. It's all part of the same thing. So Latin America is important. It's to the southeast as well because people, particularly in this country, tend to think about, or about the east maybe a little bit about Latin America, but tend to, tend to forget about Africa. The Chinese certainly don't forget about Africa. Africa and the Middle East are also going to play a part, and also Central and Eastern Europe. And I touched on Russia. Don't underestimate the power that is being developed in Germany, in Poland, and Russia currently. Germany is the strong man of Europe. It's the one economy in Europe that we think gained some momentum in Western Europe, that gained some momentum last year with the oil price at $100 and threatening to go above that in the short to medium term, Russia becomes a very, very powerful economy. There are difficulties, obviously, in operating in the country, like Russia, with its rules and regulations, or lack of them, and that's, that's problematic. But don't underestimate that eastward shift, even in the concept, context of Europe. So that's number one. And you see this in NAPI, and you see this in terms of the sponsorship, which I've already mentioned. The second issue is that most of... This is a surprise to many, but just take the auto category. There, are still, there is still productive capacity in the world for 80 million units, cars and trucks. People forget, or people think, that post Lehman, the auto industry contracted. It has not. The US capacity has. European capacity hasn't, particularly in Western Europe, because the politicians won't take the economic consequences of greater unemployment. And in the East, in South Korea, in... Japan, to some extent, the same political issues. In China, in India, Rattan Tata, Geely with Volvo, all examples. JAC, launching in Latin America. All these are examples of Chinese and, East, and Indian and Eastern expansion in the auto category, where we've ended up with the same, actually the same productive capacity as we had before, even post Lehman and everything that we had to go through with Chrysler and GM going into Chapter 11 bankrupt, bankruptcy and re-emerging. In an overcapacity world, what we do, the differentiation that agencies do, is critically important. And there's also a sort of corollary or a paradox associated, associated with that. The undercapacity, the place where the shortage will be greatest is in the supply of people. So you have this paradox in the in this millennium, that we will have overcapacity in terms of production in car, industries like cars, but it applies to most industries, and we will have undercapacity in the supply of people. All the demographics point to the supply of people being under pressure. So companies will have to differentiate themselves on the quality of their people and their ability to, in, to attract, retain, incentivize, and motivate people. So that's the second issue. The third is the web. 
which at places like NAPI, you, and I, and I understand that from Rick and Michael and others that you've been trying very uh, aggressively to reposition NAPI, but you know, NAPI comes, uh, what, towards the end of January of this, of, of this, the first month of this year. The CES, uh, which used to be what Comdex several years ago, and it was interesting, I was there with Michael and with Irwin and, and with others uh, earlier this month. The CES conference, which you would think about being sort of more a consumer electronics, has now become a center not just for the consumer electronics industry, but for our clients and indeed agencies as well. And to some extent, you know, you're seeing a similar, a similar development. I, I would uh, just say that I think the reason why CES has become so important, and this is an important point, I think, is that the technology companies are not actually technology companies. They are media owners. They're technology companies sort of, or they're masquerading as technology companies. What they really are media owners. And the reason for that, I remember we did a, a panel in Cannes uh, about four years ago. We started it. It's called the Cannes Debate. And we had representatives from, from Google, from Microsoft, from Yahoo, from AOL. And the first question, I was very much the poor man's Charlie Rose. And I, the first question I asked them was, what are you? Are you a technology company or a media company? All of them said they were technology companies. I don't think they are. I think what they are are, are the, the new media owners. And the web does three things. It disintermediates legacy traditional players. It disintermediates them with lower cost business models. And looping back to the talent point, it is a much more attractive destination for talent. So even though we lost talent in Internet 1.0, which then collapsed in 2001, 2002, and a lot of the people that we lost, not a lot, but lost some good people, came back to us. The interesting thing about the re-entry interviews that we did was they never regretted that experience. <clears throat> and they said if Internet 1.0 came again in the form of Internet 2.0, for example, which it has done, they would readdress those opportunities. So small companies, technologically driven companies that are more responsive and less bureau bureaucratic and less siloed, which is a critical issue, are more integrated and more seamless, are more attractive to young people, looping back to that talent point. Uh, a fourth area that you want to think about when you think about clients is internal communications. The biggest issue that chairman and CEOs have internally is an internal one. It's how they communicate strategic and structural change internally. In the case of WPP, how do I get 140,000 people to face in the same direction at the same point in time, particularly when we've done it over 25 years, a lot by acquisition, although organic growth has played a role, and particularly when we've, for, for certain reasons, for reasons of, of conflict, uh, of clients, client conflict, for reasons sometimes client of, of conflict of people, for reasons of scale, because economic, the econo economies of scale in creative businesses are difficult to generate. In media buying, you can do it. In media investment management as a whole, perhaps you can do it. But scale brings issues in, in creative businesses. In those circumstances, internal communications are critically important. The easier model is an organically driven business, uh, which is not which has not made acquisitions and which is unibranded. So internal communications is a big issue. I mentioned retail. Just think about the power that Walmart, Tesco, and Carol Four, for example, have in their negotiations and their relationships with the big FMCG companies. Particularly in a low inflation world where the FMCG companies have very little pricing power. And I just remind you that our clients have had little price, pricing power probably for about 20 years. Ever since the early 1990s, we've not had significant inflation in the world economy. And Walmart, on its own, is the seventh largest country in the world by retail sales. So these companies, these retail companies, put enormous pressure on manufacturers at a time particularly when we have little inflation. And that is an opportunity and that's, for example, why a company like Procter & Gamble buys into direct marketing channels like Ocado in the UK, which is a website, basically, for consumers to order groceries directly. That's a, that's a, a fifth issue. A sixth issue, and this is important in terms of how to sell in content and programming ideas, that most companies are going more global in the way they're organized and run. It's true that country management is becoming 
more important because size of companies is growing. But still, if you look at the way that companies are organizing themselves, increasing, increasingly, global influence becomes more important. So if you look at the structure of how companies like Procter, like Unilever, are organizing themselves, they're integrating their functions more at the center. Three other final issues you want to think about as well is that procurement and the rise of the finance function inside clients has become critically important. We may not like it in the agency business. We don't believe we sell widgets. We think we sell planning, ideas, content, distribution. But essentially, clients, because of the economic pressures they face, are putting more emphasis on cost, particularly in the Western world. So the whole role of procurement and the financial function in a low inflation environment where pricing power is limited is critically important. Uh, and the final couple of issues you want to think about are the role of government, because government as not only as a regulator or as a procurer is important, but also as a client, because governments have injected about $12 trillion into the world's economy, which is about $65 trillion in the last couple of years. So government is increasingly important in terms of influence. And last but not least is the whole area of corporate social responsibility. It's now commonly accepted amongst chairmen and CEOs in our view that doing good is good business. So issues of sustainability, environment, social, social good are all critically important in terms of the communications programs that clients think about. So those nine things are critically important as you think about what our clients are doing. And increasingly, they mean that branding and innovation are critically important in terms of how our clients go about it. Now, what does this mean for you and us in terms of what we're doing and how we're going about it in kissing and punching, developing content and creation? Well, I think there are a couple of points that I just want to emphasize. The, the, the first thing is we have to think about content in the context of how those, our clients' business is changing. We need to walk very closely with media owners, just like our clients, particularly because the legacy media owners are under increasing pressure. If I look at the last 10, 15 years, but particularly the last three or four, there is no doubt, if you look at, you know, if I was to put into sort of sports divisions, what, who was going to do best? I mean, just think about it in a geographical sense and a functional sense. Who is in division one in the top league in terms of growth opportunities? Well, it, on, geographically, it would be the BRICS and Next 11. And then from a, from a functional point of view, it certainly would be the new media. What do I mean by the new media? I mean PC-driven media. I mean mobile-driven media. I mean video content-driven media. I mean smartphone-driven media, iPhone, iPad-driven media, social network-driven media. All demanding different... That's sort of the, the top league. The second league, I would say, is the USA and Germany. Never underestimate the USA. Never write it off. It's 300 million people. Vast natural resources, human resources, immigrant culture always capable of dealing, or certainly to date, capable of dealing with economic and political challenges. In the 1980s, we, well not we, people wrote off America, said Japan was going to take over. That didn't happen. And also in that second division, I put free-to-air television. You know, it was mentioned in the preamble that, that, I think by Rick, that television viewing has grown. One of the things that that Erwin and Reno Scanzoni as well, who, who looks after Group M's trading in, the, in North America, always remark is the growth in television viewing and the increasing penetration. I've got to, I've got to say that the definition of television viewing is, is, is increasingly important. How you define it is increasingly important. You know, if I view a program on a smartphone or on, on an iPad, is that television in the classical sense or not? My view, it is not television in the classical sense. You have a, a definitional issue. For example, if I have my gnome box, which I do in the UK, which takes the audio feed off Sky, is that radio or is that TV? It's a TV channel food, so feed. So there's a definite, definitional issue. But never underestimate, just like the USA and Germany, the size of free-to-air television and its potential and the potential of live audiences whether it be an Olympics, whether it be a World Cup, whether it be a Super Bowl. And I just 
you know, I ask you, I wonder whether anybody in the audience knows what is the biggest live audience in the world at the moment. Most people will fast that they say the Beijing opening ceremony or they say the FIFA World Cup final. It's neither of those. It's the, actually the gala Chi CCTV Chinese New Year gala show. 1.1 billion people watch it. So these live audiences, which are driven by free-to-air television, and television is classical form, I would put in second division. Who do I put in the third division? I would put probably from a geographic point of view, Western Europe, excluding Germany. I'd probably put France, Italy, and Spain, the major economies in Western Europe. And I, I put the UK probably maybe going into division two because the government has dealt with the deficit or is trying to deal with the deficit issue. And that gives them a platform for further growth. And from a functional point of view, I put newspapers and periodicals, magazines. They have the toughest role in dealing with the digital challenge and the online channels challenge. And in their classical shape, I don't think, they won't die, but they're going to be under continued pressure. What about Division 4? I don't have any functional one for Division 4, but I put Japan geographically in it. Uh, Japan has show, has been, for 20 years has been a malfunctioning economic engine and still shows no signs of, of changing. And those of you who wrestle with the problems of dealing in Japan, like we have, we're the largest gaijin presence in Japan, know what I'm talking about. It still shows little or no sign of changing. That's how we see the world. We have to work with the legacy media owners because they are very challenged. And we have to work in the content and branding area. And one of the things that, that we're in the process of doing now is forming on the back of Group M and on the back of Group M Entertainment and the other things that we do around WPP, not only in the entertainment area, but in the sports area and event area, we are forming a programming and content division that will create, that will produce with others and distribute. That's where the kiss and the punch comes in. We are, we are going to initiate and we are going to cooperate increasingly in the content area because that we see as being critical as we develop our relationships with our challenged clients who have to deal with, for the foreseeable future, slow growth in the West and big opportunities in the BRICS and Next 11 and challenged media owners, particularly legacy media owners, and very different new media owners who are very hungry to explore all these areas and develop platforms and, and content. So. We are going to be, we intend to be in the forefront of developing these, these content ideas. And I, I just mentioned one that we've done recently. China's Got Talent in China. It was done around the Shanghai Expo. In fact, the winner, the pianist, an, an, an armless pianist, uh, who actually is interesting, 500 million people watch that program, the final. Uh, in one way or another, I guess 500 million people participated and changed the concept of disability. Most people smirk when they hear about a, an armless pianist. Um, changed the, the feeling about disability in China in a remarkable way, in a sort of at a stroke. Because in China, physical disability is, one, is something that is culturally or has historically culturally been, been an issue. So the power of some of these things is very considerable, not just in an economic, but in a social context as well. That's why I mentioned the CSR issue, because it's extremely important in the context of sponsorship and programming and content. And the last point that, that I want to mention, which is terribly important, is the following. If I look at WPP today, as opposed to 25 years ago, or even 10 or 15 years ago, we used to say we did three things. We used to say that we, we, we strategic thinking is a bit like that comment about if you crossed WPP and McKinsey, you would get media link. God forbid, I mean, it sort of, <laughs> if you crossed, uh, anybody would end up looking like Michael Kassan. But it, 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 it's, it's, but when you think about what we did, it was, certainly was strategic thinking, and we still do that. It certainly was creating the big ideas, and it certainly was about distribution. You know, a big network in 106, 107 countries distributing product, whether it be content 
or whatever. But the business has fundamentally changed. And there are two other things, and this is where we vary from our competition quite, quite dramatically. We see our business as being more complicated in many senses, but there are two other things that we do are critically important. Inside WPP of its $15 billion of revenue last year, $5 billion came from market research for what we call consumer insight. Understanding how consumers are behaving and changing their behaving, behavior, particularly in a post-layman world, is absolutely critical. By the way, it's not just consumers that have changed their habits, particularly in the West, post-layman. It's corporates, too. I do not believe that corporates will behave for the foreseeable future in the same way as before that layman weekend. Being cautious about efficiency and effectiveness and indeed liquidity is seared into the consciousness of companies that almost thought they were going to go bankrupt. Or not almost. You know, Jeff Immelt said within 48 hours on September the 13th, he had been advised that GE Capital would not be able to raise capital on the corporate market. So 40 to 50% of their profits would be at risk. Warren Buffett called it the American financial Pearl Harbor. So this is seared into their consciousness. So it's not just understanding how consumers have changed, it's corporates as well. And that's critically important. So, so data and the analysis of data is critically important. And lastly, the application of technology. We bought 24 seven real media. It was quite closely examined. People said it was, very, it was very expensive. But what we did with it was create and invest in an independent platform. And it comes back to the point that I made. It's critically important that we operate independently, and it is not felt that we recommend one medium rather than another because we have a vested or tangible interest in doing so. We're in an, in a, in a, an, a, an area and the, where we have trust and responsibility, and we cannot base our business on financial criteria rather than qualitative criteria. So those are just some of the things that I want to touch on. I think Michael now wants to, to open it up to Q&A, so we'll try and do that. So thank you very much indeed. Are we, are, we, are we mic'd? Are we on? So, so Martin, you, you, you touched on so many points that, that open up the conversation. And first of all, thank you so much. Um, and to, to the point you made that underscores what Rick talked about, advertising has forever played a role in, in this business, and that inextricable link is not getting less. In fact, I, I shared with you anecdotally a story today, and, and I think John Feltheimer's in the audience, but when back in, in one of the NatBees back in New Orleans, I was walking the floor back then with Irwin, and there was a line of people, I think it was when John was running uh, Sony television, there was a line of people waiting to uh, kiss John's ring, and I looked at Irwin and commented, it's interesting they're lined up to kiss John's ring, we paid for the ring. And so advertising, um, and John does have a nice ring, but advertising has forever yeah, I think played. Yeah, I think we'll be a little bit careful. This is our client's money. We consolidate the client's money. I mentioned we moved from, say, three or four buying points because we started with Mindshare. We then acquired MEC through YNR, Mediacom through Gray, and we created Maxis as a separate brand. We consolidate them. They're one buying point. Uh, you know, in Germany, where we have a very significant market share, 40, 45% of the market, Italy, very, very similar. Uh, we're, this is, we're a custodian. Uh, we're an agent. I mean, I, I think just in the context of this, increasingly, I think we want to use our position to be principal as well as agent or broker. In other words, this is the big opportunity in working particularly with legacy media owners and indeed new media owners is to think of ways where we, it's not dissimilar to the sports rights business in, in, in essence. I mean, I mentioned I worked with Mark McCormack, it was many years ago. He was somewhat hesitant 30, 40 years ago to commit in advance. But I do, I do think his view was if you bought a sports right, you laid it off so you had no principal risk. I think, interestingly, and this may be a somewhat controversial thing to say, but I do think it's a bit like, and maybe it's not the right thing to say because of 
the pressures under the, of the banking business or the investment banking business. But I, I do think there are some big opportunities that we have to explore with media owners where we can buy as principles positions in assets, in rights, in programs, in content, and work with media owners to see how we can syndicate that and distribute it in an effective way. That is the big opportunity, I think, uh, to, to do. I, I, I agree with that, Martin. And, and you and I talked also about um, the experience at CES where Microsoft um, was asked after they did a presentation to the Coca-Cola Corporation um, about the fact, and many of the clients you listed as your primary largest clients have this same experience. Microsoft, I think, commented that a billion people a day touch a Microsoft product in some way, shape, or form. Right. Unilever has said two billion people, Coca-Cola the same thing. Yeah. What Coca-Cola asked Microsoft, and I would ask you, that's great that you touch a billion people a day. How do we get to that next billion? Well, uh, that, that's true. I mean, if you take Bob McDonald at, at, at P&G, when he took over from A.G. Lafley as CEO, he said, I, you know, I'm trying to get a billion new consumers uh, or additional consumers for p and But what was really interesting about what he said was not only that, but as he said, where are they going to come from? They'll come from India and China. And, and you know, having, you know, sitting here in Miami, sitting here in New York or in, uh, in, in, in LA is an advantage and a disadvantage because you tend to focus a little bit parochially on your own market. And, and I mean, let's, let's be quite clear about it. America is still the biggest market in the world by a country mile. It is $15 trillion of GMP against China might be the second large economy, but it's still only five, it's still, still one third. But if it's 65 million, a trillion for the world, it's another 50 out there beyond America. And we have to get into our, our minds. And I'm, I'm saying this as somebody from the UK as well, although I split my time or try to half time between the UK and the US. If you're French, it's the same. If you're German, it's the same. You're Italian, you're Spanish. You have to look at a broader canvas. So Nappy you know, comes to Miami, or you want to come back to Miami. It's not just about Miami, ladies and gentlemen. It's you know, some of the best, con you know, I talk about, uh, if you talk about Ugly Betty, or China's Got Talent, or you know, Ugly Betty what, came through Televisa, I think I'm right in saying, in Mexico into China. I mean, it's quite extraordinary some of the things that are going on within our industry and the content industry. So you've got to look at the whole world. And the reason that I boringly went through our strategy and what our clients are thinking about is that's where the growth is going to come from. I mean, if we look at the prospects for the West, Western Europe in particular, but the US as well, because the US is going to have to grapple with their deficit maybe not before the next general election, but after 2012, that is going to put some pressure on the, the, the American economy with the slack being taken up outside. So the really big opportunities are going to be in China, in India, in Brazil, in Colombia, in Mexico, Argentina, all these, these places in some of the African countries, South Africa, et cetera, that we see, or Bangladesh and Vietnam and all these countries that are becoming more prominent. So, Martin, let's, let's focus on something that's here. And you, um, you've hedged your bet well in this space, and it's an area that I think is interesting to the folks in the audience around addressability. Yeah. I'm going to take a leap here. So you've made investments in, in two, or at least two, that I'm yeah. aware of, of the leading companies that are talking about addressability in commercial messaging, right. in Vidi and Visible World. Right. And, and, you know, it, 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 it begs two questions. Number one, should we be as excited as, as marketers around addressability? And number two, we get to the second piece is the privacy issues that come from that as it relates to marketers well, and content creators. On the first, it's critical. I mean, I talked about the two things which have changed our business, in my view, which is data, which you know, the reason why addressability is so important is the new technologies enable us to know far more about who's consuming when and where and how and how they will do in the future. And these changes, you know, if anybody thinks that these changes are not significant, because you can, when you say that television viewing has increased, that can make people complacent. And, and that's why I, I touched on this point about how you define television viewing. It's critically important because it, you know, it's, it's blurred so significantly. So data, analysis, 
information, addressability, targeting is critically important. And, and every one of these new technologies, and even the old technologies, as they've been revamped, rebranded, repackaged, give us an ability to understand in a far, far more effective way. So I think it's critical, Michael. It links into the application of technology and data in an in a extremely important way. Um, we, you know, in a way, you have to become a venture capital company. Uh, and we, 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 we do several things. So we say to not just Group M and its brands, but JWT and Ogilvy and Y&R and Gray, we say you have to be more digital, you have to be more addressability savvy and, and technology savvy. We then say we will acquire businesses that we graft on or embed inside the existing brands. And then the third arm is that we, make, we buy companies. You know, we acquired Blue State Digital, for example, just before, just before Christmas, the, the company that used new, new media methods effectively to solicit Obama's presidential campaign funds in new ways and using new techniques. So we, we acquire companies like that, and we make investments. You mentioned NVIDIA Invisible World, but we make NVIDIA in Wild Tangent, in Omniture, in Buddy Media. I mean, we're trying to experiment and invest and learn. I mean, you take the Omniture and Buddy Media examples. These are investments that we made in order to train our people more effectively. So in both cases, we're trying to train, train 500 people, let's say, in the technology. And the, so the point that you raise about addressability is critically important. It changes the nature of what we do. Uh, and don't lull yourself into a full sense of security by saying that a lot of people are watching a screen and therefore the traditional means of delivery is going to be as important. It's changing all the time. And the other thing is, you know, we, you hear CEOs, just like myself, talk boringly about their grandchildren and their children about how things are so different and things. I mean, the fact is that if we think the pace of change has been pretty rapid for the last few years, just stand by. Because there, there is a generational shift, and we see it inside WPP companies. When the leaders of the companies change, their attitudes change, you know, to seamlessness and breaking down the silos or thinking about WPP rather than individual brands. The attitudinal shift when the generation shifts is colossal. And you always underestimate the impact of that. So when people's media habits change, or when they change, their media habits can change. Well, and, and, and to that, I would uh, pen the question around, you talked about all the technologies um, in your remarks and just now. What would you say of all of them is the most disruptive now in terms of what we experienced at CES? And you know, as I said at CES, Martin, it wasn't your first trip. For many in the business, it was their first. You've been going yeah. for many years. But what do you think is Not the most Not as many as I should have done. Is there, um, I think you know, mobile, I mean, I think smartphone mo mobility is probably the most disruptive uh, in the sense that you, know, you can do it when you want, whenever you like. I mean, you, you choose now, the consumer chooses. I think the mobility, you know, if you think about the iPad, it was its first iteration. I mean, if I think about my life, it's been changed by the mobile phone, by the Blackberry, and by the iPad. And I don't think, I'm not technologically savvy, I'm just uh, We all have Erwin for that. We yes, so that's right, we have Erwin takes us on these grand tours of the, uh, the CES. I, I think we should make that into a business, actually. I think we make more money out of that than we do. I do, yeah, actually. No, well, you would, but because you always take advantage of these things. Um, um, but, but, Is no, there a problem I, here? I, I don't know. <laughs> um, no, I, I, I think that's, that, that's, that area is probably, the mobility is probably the most, and, the, and that's probably the, most, the single most important shift so far, but I'm sure there's somebody sitting in some shed in Bangalore who's going to come up with something that we'll all be astounded by. So, Martin, back in the, in the um, early part of this millennium, when all the noise was coming up yep. around Madison and Vine, yes. and certainly something important to the folks in this yes. room, and there was that moment when the regulations were about to change and yep. maybe, you know, you could invest in talent agencies or you could yeah. you know, participate. We had a lot of conversations about yes. that back then. Talk to do ratio was very high on that. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Talk to do was very high. Mm. And, and my question is today, 2011, yeah. 
the right constituents around the table. You know, we still don't have a, a guaranteed right constituency. We have the media agencies, and as yeah. you talk about that, yeah. your creative agencies are yeah. interested and yeah. rightfully have a seat at the yeah. table. Yeah. The talent agencies, yeah. the content creators want to talk directly to the clients and yeah. to them. What, what do you see as the right okay, Before seat? that, because you asked about privacy, and I just oh. want to say one thing on privacy. Um, it is absolutely essential that we stick with opt-out from our, our point of view, that you know, the European Commission have given us a lead on that as long as we are responsible, and it has to be self-regulation, right? Uh, we, mustn't get into, we mustn't get into more regulation on that, so just, just say that. As to the participants, it's so difficult. I mean, I mean they all have a role to play. They are all frenemies. Um, it's very, I mean, I mean, just let me just jog back a bit, because as you were asking the question, I mean, our industry went back, you know, there are several in, investing institutions here, Michael's here from, from Namura and um, Michael Nathanson, got me having a chat, a little chat before. If I think back to what investing institutions thought about our industry five years ago, there was the G word, that we were gonna be totally disintermediated by Google. Uh, we sort of got over that a bit. I mean, we haven't done brilliantly, but we haven't done badly. And in fact, if I went back five years, you know, people were going to say we were going to die. Um, we got over G word, and then as soon as we got over the G word, there was the R word, the recession. It was going to kill us as well. And here we are a couple of years later. You know, if you'd said to me on September the 13th, 2008, that our industry would be, uh, that we WPP would be back to where we are today, I would have said you need your head examined because... Our revenues are pretty much back to where they were. Our headcount probably is about 8% lower, which mirrors a lot where our clients are, where, where they, they're back to where they were in terms of revenues, and yet their cost bases are much lower. So that's a little bit of the history. You know, who are the right players? I mean, clearly the technology companies, because I think they are the new media owners. Clearly the legacy media owners. Clearly the clients. Clearly the agencies. The talent agencies... Obviously, very bright people. You know, you have Adweek with its picture of um, Ari Emanuel, who looks like a hitman, <laughs> uh, on, on, the, on the front cover with his glasses and, and whatever, and his mobile phone. Uh, but Michael Ovitz, bless him, was, was going to do the same. You know, the, the, the classic one, I'm not complacent about it, but you know, the classic one was that McCann Erickson pitched Coca-Cola with, uh, with, what was it, uh, 20 people and one idea and Ovitz pitched it with one person and 20 ideas. That was the, what people said at the time. McKinsey, you know, talking about McKinsey, we're going to get, you know, we're going to kill the advertising agencies, they're going to get into the marketing side of the business. I think, you know, we've, what is interesting, we are seeing the consulting companies, IBM, uh, Accenture, getting into the technology industry. Now, I think it, I can't remember which is left brain and which is right brain, which is creative and which is, uh, may, which may be my personal defect. May explain a lot about me, but, but whether it's left brain or right brain, those organizations like Accenture IBM tend to be more, more uh, the, about the mathematical and the physical. Uh, we tend to be more about the emotional. Uh, and we say we think that rather than it is a fact that. So there's some differences there. I, I think those are the players at the table. I think the, essentially it's the new and old media, it's the clients and the agencies. I think the thing for us is that we have to develop much closer relationships with the media owners. And I just say one thing about the media industry. There are three things that we think that have to take place. Cl consumers, customers, have to pay for content. It's absolutely critical. <coughs> so Rupert Murdoch has to succeed. Uh, or, I mean, there are others. I, I went to the FT management conference a couple of days ago in the UK. They have been very aggressive in, in subscriptions. There is not enough advertising to go around to finance the business models of all these new media. So subscriptions, pay-per-view, whatever, that's number one. Number two, there has to be more consolidation. Yeah, we will see what happens with B Sky B and News Corp as an example. In my view, that has to go through for the health and development of the industry. And there has to be more. In Spain, Mediaset got together with the Palancos channel. Good example, the market stabilized, even though Spain is, is very challenged. 
And the last thing is that state subsidy probably has to play an even greater role to maintain professional journalism. The danger, I, I don't, this is a personal view, I don't think consumer generated content is qualitatively good enough to replace professionals. So when the Australian government put 200 million Australian dollars back into the TV industry because digital had given them such a hard time, you're gonna see more of that. And my favorite story is the FCC report which suggested putting a $500 million fund together to, to boost and subsidize traditional media owners in America because of the pressure they've been under. Well, it, it, it's interesting you talked about that because um, in, in this last year working with um, the FCC a bit on, on the uh, merger that's about to yeah. happen with Comcast and, and <clears throat> NBC about to close, I had a conversation with the chairman and we brought together um, leaders from the industry. So we brought uh, uh, somebody from WPP, somebody from Omnicom, somebody from IPG, and somebody who, from who Google. Who are they? Who are they? <laughs> those those oh, other uh, people. Oh, okay, fine. Okay. And we had a conference call right before Christmas to talk about the industry's view of the merger. Yeah. And it, and it was interesting, after the fact, the deal was approved, and <clears throat> I was invited to give a quote to AdAge, and I mentioned to uh, the chairman what I, you know, he asked me my opinion, which I was flattered sure. that he cared, and I said, well, I, I, you know, I gave a quote to AdAge. He said, gee, and it was such an interesting comment, he said, gee, that's not one of the publications that we subscribe to in our clip around news reporting, and, you know, no... Well, maybe with Michael Wolf as editor it will be, who knows? Yeah, but, but note to the chairman, yeah. you know, the advertising industry has a lot to say about these issues that are affecting. Yeah, but I think, I think the Comcast thing is really interesting, right? So instead of being a subsidiary of a conglomerate, instead of being, you know, it's the old Theodore Levitt quote, we're in, not in the buggy whip industry, we're in the transportation industry. If you're part of GE, and this is nothing against GE, because obviously immensely powerful, strong, uh, thoughtful, strategically, extremely intelligent company, but to, to Inside Comcast, NBC must be in a better position with a focused media company where you're not at the end. I mean, to be blunt, I mean, I shouldn't say this, but the FT sitting inside Pearson is not dissimilar. Pearson's an education company. What's a major financial journal? You know, you're gonna be, you're gonna be at best, number three or number four in the line for resources, whereas if you're in a focused company, you're further up the, the chain in no terms question. of getting people resources, capital resources, investment resources, whatever it is. Martin, I want to go to one other thing, and then I'm going to open it up for a few minutes to some questions from the audience. But, you know, I, I don't think anybody's done this better than you have in the marketplace. And I, I always kidded about it back in my days as a lawyer and now in this business when people tried to use that word, the C word. You talked about the G word and the R word. I talk about the C word, the conflict word. Right. And I, I, I learned from somebody years ago, from Dennis Holt actually, that there's no such thing as a conflict, there are just ironies. Mm -hmm. And so I've, I've tried to look at it that way, but you've made it a, a science. But you've I would say it it's a, a science. Well, but you've done it in a very artful way because just the fact that you listed That's the companies... That's even more dangerous, dangerous word than science. Exactly. Art, artful. Wow. But, but, but even just the fact of listing yeah. both P&G and Unilever right. as two of your four largest clients, you know, well, years ago, couldn't happen. Yeah, but, well, we, 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 we can't get away with it just like, like the investment banks or the consulting companies who have the same channel uh, that handle it. So we have to have separate... And, and, and listen, we do it in a very sophisticated way, not artful, not scientific, or maybe scientific, but we do it in a very organized way. We have separate, it's not just Chinese walls. We have auditing. We even have financial penalties if we make mistakes, right? I mean, the, we've gone through it with geographical separate geographical locations. But, you know, in a way, and maybe I shouldn't say this, but I will say it, in a way, it had to happen because the pressures are so great, uh, particularly you know, in the last few years in this low inflationary environment, uh, there's been pressure on fees. There've been, you know, we've gone away from the, the day we were talking about Mad Men and Lionsgate just before. I mean, it, it, it's no longer Don Draper. There's no longer 15% or 17.5% on cost for production. There are no longer 
cozy oligopolies between private companies. I mean, just one story, which is truly extraordinary. When I joined Saatchi's in 1977, the Saatchi brothers had caused a furore because they said, we're not going to be members of the IPA, the Incorporated Practitioners of Advertising, which was the Advertising Agency Association. And the reason was that one of the rules of the Advertising Association was that members of the association did not pitch each other's business. <laughs> now, it's extraordinary. I mean, I wish that was the case today, but, but, uh, <laughs> but it's extraordinary. Right? I thought it was. So, so, so we're, not, we're not in those cozy days. Uh, you know, that, those have gone. Because of that pressure, that has forced consolidation. That's one thing. The second thing is, we, as the needs of going global have got greater, private partnerships or private companies were unable to finance the growth and development of these operations. You, you know, whatever you say about the small, you know, the trade press loves, to, loves David rather than Goliath. What's interesting about the last couple of years is that Goliath has become more powerful. Because the needs of our clients, you know, I tried to say, you know, WPP's objectives are new markets, new media, and consumer insight. The new markets piece, which is both BRICS and Next11, you know, let's, let's hypothesize for a minute. Let's say Cuba opened up all our clients were going to Cuba. Let's say that, that Burma or Myanmar became politically acceptable. Let's even really get hypothetical, let's say Iran. You know, that we, there was a rapprochement, just like there was with Libya, with Iran. Unlikely, but possible. You know, we would have tremendous opportunities on the back of political and legal acceptance to go in on the back of that with our client portfolios. Small companies can't do that. And so the, the, the needs of the business have changed. That's the reason why there's been consolidation, and that's the reason, one of the reasons why we've been able to deal with conflict, conflicting accounts. Martin, uh, extraordinary as, 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 as advertised. Is there are any questions from the audience? We've got a couple of minutes for a couple of questions, and there's a microphone over here. If, if I could ask you to, A, identify yourself, and B, step up to the microphone. Yes, I'm uh, Charles Hartman from Entree Concierge, and I'm wondering two things. Wondering, in the markets that you uh, see as emerging and very powerful in Latin America and the East, do you also include Russia in that in market? Yeah, I, I, I did. As I said, I, I mean, I think Russia, you know, a lot, a lot of people... First of all, these are not emerging markets. They've emerged. You know, for anybody to say that China is the second largest economy in the world that is emerging, I think is insulting to the Chinese. I, I just give you one little demonstration. One of our competitors held its first American base. I won't say which one, except it was one of the ones that Michael just mentioned. Held, <laughs> held its first board meet. This is insulting. Held yeah. its first board meeting outside the United States ever this year, last year in China. That is, to my mind, absolutely extraordinary. Yeah. So these markets now, do I include Russia? Yes. Uh, the oil price, at, it's certainly at $100. It may well go higher. The, economy, the Russian economy works at $60 to $70. I think the Eastern European alliance axis is a bad word to use, but I'll use it. Germany, Poland, Russia becomes immensely powerful. Yeah, the New York Times was just writing about that this Sunday. Yeah, well, it, we, we, you heard it from us before the New York Times. <laughs> you, you, you heard it, you know, you've had three things that happened which are really significant. Pepsi buying Wimbledon, Wimbledon, uh, Russia winning the World Cup for 2018, and the third thing is the Rosneft BP deal, mm. which is truly, if, if you'd said to me that Rosneft would end up with 5% of BP and have an ability to go higher. Don't forget that. There's no restriction, restriction technically, I think, until they get to 29.9%. That is pretty extraordinary. Mm -hmm. So Russia, it, the problem with Russia is it's a very difficult market to operate in, which is a euphemism for other things, but you can imagine what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the problem. So, but, but you ignore Russia in all senses of the words at your peril. At your peril. Yeah. yeah. The, the other shorter question is, how does that pianist play? Very well. Uh, he's, he's <laughs> Along just, with that. He's just like Lang Lang. He's like a sort of Chinese Liberace. Yeah. They're really good, actually. I mean, it's, it was marvelous. At, at one level, it was absolutely fantastic. Mm. And is Owen in the audience? Sorry? Owen, you mentioned. Owen. That. Owen. Where's Owen? Owen? Stand up, Owen. There's Owen. He's waving. He's not drowning. He's waving. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Sounds like you've got a customer, Owen. Look out. 
So Martin, you mentioned about C word and G word and R word. My question is about F word. So there's a finance man coming to the negotiation table. Now this bringing these people who buy paper clips and waste paper basket to trade you negotiation or rather buy purchase a procurement of creative services and strategic planning services and media services. Um, have clients blunt the creative process and change the creative dynamics of agencies as well as the media world? So do, do, you th do you think that bringing these procurement people to the negotiation table and excessive uh, uh, cost orientation and the process orientation, clients have influenced adversely agencies' creative dynamics? Well, I, I, it, all I'm saying is that, you know, like all, everything in life, it's about balance. And, and post layman companies went into, well, 2009, many people believed they were going to go out of business. Or the, the experience of that layman, and if you haven't read Too Big to Fail, Andrew Ross Sorkin's book, I really plead with you to read it, because you, I think it really tells you what happened on that weekend, assuming that it's most of it, if not all of it, is accurate. Uh, we really did come very close to, a fin to financial catastrophe catastrophe. 2009, people thought the world was going to come to an end. 2010 was slightly different because they realized you can't cut costs. You know, there's a finite limit to what you can do on costs, whereas at least until you get to 100% market share, there's, you can go for growth on, on, on the top line. So people started to look at the BRICS and Next11. And then I think 2011 will be the same, but more so, would be my, my view, that we'll see a rebalancing. Because 2010 was remarkable that America bounced back and traditional media bounced back. My view on procurement is very simple. It's here to stay, particularly as long as inflation is under control, uh, when you don't have pricing power. The, the, you know, a couple of package goods clients have said to me that the reason why they're putting so much pressure on us on, on fees is a referred pain, referred pain from retail. If you deal with Walmart, with Tesco, with Carrefour, other suppliers, <laughs> Have to, they have to extract retribution from others, other suppliers. So it's a little bit of that. My view is just about balance, right? Our strategic thinking, our creative big ideas, our network distribution, our application of technology, our insight into data. We, you know, we've got to, you've got to be paid well or reasonably well to do that. Don't forget that you know, our commission in the old days, it used to be 15%. We're probably on average around about 9, 10, 11% if I take media and creative and planning together. That's what we get. It's not an enormous amount. There's another 90% that goes elsewhere. David Ogilvy said this 50 years ago. You're looking at the problem through the wrong end of the telescope. And you know, that's, what, that's why there's been such a heavy emphasis by procurement on media reviews and, and media costs, uh, and as a result, you know, we've seen, we've seen what's been happening. So I, it's a question about balance. I know we're reaching the end. I, I would add one thing to that, though, and, and, and I think Rick's going to um, tell us we have to end. But we, we talked about this a couple of months ago. I would say, and I agree with you, Martin, procurement's here to stay. They're part of the orchestra. The question is, are they the lead violin or are they part of the orchestra? And I think if you put them in that right position, they're, they're yeah, going to Yeah, well, I just want to finish on one story. We had, I won't say which client for obvious reasons. And uh, during the midst of a review, I rang the CMO. And this is a prominent company. And I said, um, I said look, I just want you to know that the balance has got out of control. And, and the marketing function has no control. And the procurement function is totally in, 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 in control. And he said to me, memorably, he said, he said, I agree totally with you. Why don't you make the point and I'll be right behind you? <laughs> <laughs> On that note, can we please welcome, I mean, please thank Michael and Sir Martin. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thanks, Phil.